So actually, it's a different verse that we'll be reading today, but the topic is the same. Um, it, we will be actually reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter, or sorry, Canto 11, entitled General Information, chapter 7, entitled Krishna Instructs Uddhav, verse 52. Nati sneha prasangova karta vyakva pikena chit kurvan vindeta santapam kaput ivadina di. Na, not. Ati sneha, excess affection. Prasangaha, close association. Va, or. Kartavya, one should manifest. Kva api, ever. Kena chit with anyone or anything, kurvan, so doing, vindeta, one will experience, santapam, great distress, kapotaha, the pigeon, iva, just has, dinadhi, cripple-minded. Translation, one should never indulge in excessive affection or concern for anyone or anything. Otherwise, one will have to experience great suffering, just like the foolish pigeon. Purport. The Sanskrit prefix ati, or excessive, indicates affection or attachment in which there is no Krishna consciousness. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 529, Surdam Sarva Bhutanam, the Lord is the eternal well-wisher of every living being. The Lord is so affectionate that he sits in the heart of every conditioned soul and accompanies him throughout his endless wandering in the kingdom of Maya, patiently waiting for the conditioned soul to come back home back to Godhead. Thus, the Lord makes all arrangements for the eternal happiness of every living entity. The best way for anyone to show compassion and affection for all living beings is to become a preacher on behalf of Lord Krishna and assist the Lord in reclaiming the fallen souls. If our affection or attachment for others is based on bodily sense gratification in the name of society, friendship, and love, that excessive unwanted affection at the sneha will cause burning pain at the time of breaking or just destruction of the relationship. Now the story of the foolish pigeon will be narrated. A similar story is described in the seventh canto, second chapter, Srimad Bhagavatam, told by Yamaraj to the mourning widows of King Suyakya. <laughs> Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutare, Sri Mate Chandra Mali Swami Nati Namine. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutare, Sri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nati Namine. Namaste Saratvate Deve Gauri Ne, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pasya Tadesh Patani Ne, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadha. Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Manchaka Patra Vishya Kripa Sundiva Eva Cha Tita Nam Pavanebhyo Vishnavibhyo One should never indulge in excessive affection or concern for anyone or anything. Otherwise, one will have to experience great suffering, just like the foolish pigeon. So Hare Krishna, everybody. Um, very, very deeply grateful to you all for choosing to spend your time here today. Um, there are so many other things that you can be doing with your time. Um, so I really appreciate you being here to encourage me. And I actually wanted to begin by um, just glorifying our Guru Maharaj for a moment because Recently, I was speaking to him and telling him that I'm really longing for more time with Shastra. And I was telling him that, you know, I really need to, I used to have really good habits with reading and I really need to get back to that. And his response was, well, let me help you and ask you to give class on such and such date, because obviously to give class, you must prepare and uh, um, absorb yourself into the Shastras. 
And that day that he asked me to give class, I wasn't available. I was facilitating some other seva. Um, and so he said, okay. He said, I was just trying to help. I'm just trying to you know, do what I can to help you. And of course I was so appreciative. But then after he asked Srimati Mataji when he knew that he would be traveling these days to ask me again if I could give class. And this is not because I have any qualification. In fact, I mean, I'm just looking at the names that are on this chat in the Zoom room, and I'm the least qualified to give this class. Um, but this is Guramaraj's mercy that he's engaging me so that it's for my own purification, for my own learning. And I feel deeply grateful to all of you who are my brothers and sisters and teachers who are here to encourage and support me in my um, desire and quest to just read more and be more um, absorbed in Shastra. So thank you so much for being here. So this canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, this is canto 11. And if you don't mind, no pressure. If you don't mind, I would love to see some of your faces. If, the, if it's not doable, I totally understand. Um, so thank you, Prabhu Hare Krishna. Hare Bal. Oh, so nice to see your faces, Vrinda Hare Krishna. Um, so this 11th canto, um, is very special because this 11th canto is where the Bhagavad Gita begins. So as we all know, we have the Bhagavad Gita where Sri Krishna is speaking to his best friend, Arjun, and the Bhagavad Gita is spoken on the battlefield of Kurucheta. And then in this 11th canto, just as Krishna is preparing to wrap up his pastimes in the material world, he has this long conversation with his cousin, and very close confidant, Uddhava. And there are, I think it's chapter 7 to 29 in this 11th canto, known as the Uddhavgit, where Sri Krishna is instructing Uddhava. And so this is a very, very special portion of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And many of us know Uddhava as the personality who Krishna sent to Vrindavan as a messenger. He sent Uddhava from Matra to Vrindavan as the messenger. And in that uh, opportunity to serve, Krishna gave him that service in reciprocation for Uddhava's service and surrender to him. And he sent Uddhava to be a messenger to the gopis and to Srimati Radharani and to the residents of Braj. And in that service, you know, this is a, a royal um, princely personality, Uddhava, he's so exalted. And after sort of encountering the devotees of Braj, the gopis and Srimati Radharani, do you, do you remember his prayer? His prayer was, my prayer is only to take birth as a, as a blade of grass near Govardhan Hill so that I may just experience the dust of the lotus feet of the devotees of Braj, whose love for Krishna is beyond what I can even fathom. So this is an extremely exalted personality. Of course, Krishna spends chapters 7 to 29 speaking to Uddhava about um, you know, his instructions that he's trying to leave before wrapping up his pastimes in the material world and before the age of Kali truly begins its uh, descent. So in this um, conversation, I'll share my screen again. In this conversation, um, there's one point, verse 23, when Krishna says to Uda, although I, the Supreme Lord, can never be captured by ordinary sense perception. Those situated in human life may use their intelligence and other faculties of perception to directly search for me through both apparent and indirectly ascertained symptoms. And in this vein, Krishna starts to tell Uddhava a story about a king who meets a Brahman of a Dut or a mendicant. And it's not just any king, this is King Yadu. So this is one of Krishna's forefathers, and this is the, the, you know, the namesake of the dynasty in which Krishna appears. So King Yadu, he sees, maybe I should stop sharing again. So King Yadu sees um, this mendicant, this avidut, in the forest, and he is having this wonderful, happy life. And so King Yadu, who's always sort of eager to, to go and speak to Brahmins, and he's very cultured, of course, he approaches this Avadut and he asks him, you know, most people in this world are um, seeking fame and recognition and wealth and, um, um, you know, sense gratification. And you're here living so simply, you know, what is the secret? And their conversation ensues. And so... The Avadut, and I'm sorry, I'll share my screen one more time. 
ever did says, O King, I have taken shelter of 24 groups who are the following, the earth, air, sky, water, fire, moon, sun, pigeon and python, the sea, moth, honeybee, elephant, and honey thief, the deer, the fish, the prostitute, Pingala, the courier bird and the child, and the young girl, arrow maker, serpent, spider, and wasp. My dear king, by studying their activities, I have learned the science of the self. So these are verses 33 and 35 in the same chapter. And so chap um, verse 52, which we just read, is where he begins to speak about the pigeon. So let's talk about what he shares about the pigeon. He talks about how, so this Abadut, again, he's speaking to King Yadu about how, what the lesson, how the pigeon has become his guru. Sounds like something funny. How would a pigeon be our guru? If you live in maybe England, like Shamrani Mataji, or if you live in New York City, you, it's hard to understand how pigeons can be your guru. Um, but he tells the story of a male uh, uh, pigeon and a female pigeon. They meet, they fall in love, they make a nest together they have some babies and of course they're so happy and of course you know as parents do they're super uh, in love with their children and they will do anything to make sure that their children are okay and as birds do every day they go out and they collect some food and and twigs and whatever else that they need in order to like build the nest to take care of the nest to keep to keep replenishing the nest and to bring food for their children and as some of you might know that birds actually chew the food first and then they give it to their children to, to eat as well. So every day, the mother and the father pigeon were doing this very, very uh, devotedly and um, uh, religiously, making sure that their children would be happy and okay and healthy. One day, while both of the parents, the male pigeon and the female pigeon were both out and about scouring for food, a hunter arrived on the scene. And he put his net over the children. The children were captured. It was over the entire nest. And the mother is out and about going to collect food. And in her loving maternal way, she's on her way back to the nest to feed her children. And she sees that the children have been captured by this hunter. And of course, she's devastated. She's so distraught. She can't function. She can't even imagine what's going on. There's no more... She's not acting out of a place of, of logic. There's nothing that she can do except feel intense anxiety and pain and, and, and separation. And in her anxiety and pain, she also falls into the hunter's nest and becomes captured. Now, the husband is out and about catching you know, food and, and twigs and whatever else he needs to bring home. And he comes and he sees my children and my wife are all going to perish in the hands of this hunter. And now he's in complete distress and he is thinking, my goodness, what is my life? My, my life is worth nothing. And, and how are these, you know, how can this be happening? And the same exact thing happens to him. He falls into the net and the hunter now has possession of the entire family, the mother, the father, the children, and they all perish in the hands of the hunter. Now, this is obviously a super tragic story, whether it's about pigeons or any other species of life. Um, but pigeons and us, Actually, we're not so different, right? So we too, many of us in our society, in the Hare Krishna society, are in the Grihastha ashram, right? Where we decide to um, potentially get married uh, and potentially have children. And there's naturally going to be some attachment to our family relations. There's naturally going to be um, attachment to um, even you know, extended relations, our friends, um, maybe some of our possessions. Attachment is not bad by itself. Attachment is quite natural. In the purport of the verse that we read, the first line is the Sanskrit prefix ati, or excessive, indicates affection or attachment in which there is no Krishna consciousness. So the purport here is making a distinction between attachment with Krishna consciousness and attachment without Krishna consciousness. So oftentimes, you know, devotees and, and especially people who are a little newer to the bhakti path, they will read the Bhagavad Gita or they'll read sentences like this and they'll feel confronted and they'll feel, hey, are you telling me not to be attached to my children? Are you telling me I shouldn't be attached to my parents or to my loved ones? And the answer is no, because this verse is speak, uh, specifically speaking about excessive attachment, which is defined as without um, the presence of Krishna consciousness. So attachment in Krishna consciousness looks very different 
to when there is not Krishna consciousness. So once again, when we are raising each other, when we are raising our children, when we are participating in this family of ours that Srila Prabhupada has given us, you know, when there is the inevitable separation, when there is inevitable um, arguments or whenever there is inevitable clashes, with a Krishna conscious lens, we automatically develop the spirit of detachment where we're able to sort of understand maybe bigger picture, maybe that we're not the bodies and we're the souls and that death will ultimately part us. And the level of grief, it's not to say that that level of grief is not still very high and very strong, but we're able to sort of Krishna consciousness, this philosophy provides us with this coping mechanism and the tools to sort of cope with these kinds of tragedies in healthy ways. Whereas people who are not equipped with Krishna consciousness or God consciousness or this philosophy that we've been gifted with will cope likely in destructive ways or ways in which they don't recover and they're not able to function in society in the way that is needed. Um, and, you know, just to demonstrate this point about affection, there was one time Srila Prabhupada was uh, on a radio program and he was speaking about um, vegetarianism. The topic of vegetarian vegetarianism had come up and there was a caller, a woman who called in and she said, you know, I just I think that I think she said something along the lines of like, you know, meat is necessary for us. And like, I don't see I don't see the problem like, you know, I don't see the problem when, you know, these people, these animals are not humans. What is the big deal? And Srila Prabhupada asked her, would you eat, would you kill and eat your father? And this woman was horrified. She was like, how could you even ask me such a question? How could, like, of course I would never do that. And Srila Prabhupada's response was, well, this is a difference between me and you. Your love is limited to your relations. You love your father, you love your mother, you love your brother, your sister, your son, and your daughter. I love, and a devotee of God loves every living being. A devotee of God loves the spirit soul, and the spirit soul can reside in any kind of body. And of course, with love comes attachment. So Srila Prabhupada is not asking us to not be attached, because again, attachment is natural. He's asking us to be attached in the spirit of Krishna consciousness, because once again, that looks very, very different. And so when we think about our attachments, whether that is to family or to some of our possessions or to whatever that is, there are two ways we can think about it. Number one is, can we try to dovetail our attachment to Krishna service? So again, naturally we'll have some attachment to our family relations. Maybe we'll have some attachment to uh, our hobbies, dancing, writing, singing. Can you take those activities and those attachments and dovetail them to Krishna service? So, you know, these are some obvious examples, but I like to dance so I can dance for Krishna. I like to sing, I can sing kirtans. I like to write, there's so much to, writing to be done for Krishna and Prabhupada's movement, of course. Um, and it's also super important to know that, you know, to sort of take, you know, I listened to a class this morning and, and they use the expression, take inventory of what our attachments are understand what our attachments are and be very careful of what I know I certainly do on a regular basis this mentality of like yeah you know I have some attachment to like this tv show or I have some attachment to like I don't know drinking the coffee or whatever that is but it's okay like you know, I'm, I just need, we need to keep things balanced or, you know, I really, I really want to go see this new film or whatever that is, but, but it's okay. Bori Jan Prabhu uses this expression. We all think that our Maya is cute. And I think that that is such a brilliant expression because it's true. We do all think that our Maya is okay. Like, you know what, I've done all my rounds. I listened to class today. Like, yeah, we could watch a movie tonight. Like, it's all good. Like, um, I mean, I've even seen devotees, and I say this with no judgment at all, none at all, because I can actually relate, like getting on the plane after like something like a Radha Dish Mellows and being like, yeah, I need a dose of Maya, I'm going to watch a movie now on the film or, or whatever that is. We all do that. And we need to take inventory and make sure that we're not actually making excuses for our Maya. And that while, and at the same time, this is why we need gurus because we need to use our intelligence to understand when we are making excuses versus when there really is an attachment that is difficult for us to give up. And we are engaging in this, but we are feeling um, remorseful. We are doing it knowing that like Krishna, I don't want, I don't want to have this attachment. I'm sorry that I have this attachment. Can you help me? And so similarly, it's always 
easier to, um, sorry, I just got distracted by my own notes. One other thing I wanted to say is that uh, just a reminder that it's actually, what's, what is the 10th offense to the holy name? Can anyone say? Can you please repeat that for me? Yes, what is the 10th offense to the holy name? Uh, do not have material attachments even after understanding so many instructions on this matter. Yeah, so it's even, you know, it's easy for us to read these things and either, you know, on the one side, make excuses for ourselves or on the other side, feel like, you know, so hard on ourselves. So that's why we need to use our intelligence and have some self-compassion as well as work with our gurus and our mentors to help us understand this line between what is healthy and unhealthy attachment and where, you know, what's excusable, what's not, and in what consciousness. And so speaking of unhealthy attachments, we all have them. And we all understand this concept of actively detaching from unhealthy attachments is harder than actively attaching ourselves to something that's higher, right? So it's just like the example, like if I asked everybody, please do not think about a pink elephant. Naturally, everybody's gonna start thinking about a pink elephant, right? But if we decide to say, okay, think about this instead, then naturally the pink elephant kind of just fades and goes into the background. So again, it's much easier to attach ourselves to something positive than it is to try to detach ourselves from something negative. And His Holiness Bhakti uh, Bhagavat Swami told me once that, you know, the opposite of attachment is not detachment. The opposite of attachment is being unattached because once you attach yourselves to something higher, you will naturally become unattached to this other sort of lower thing, this other lower um, uh, attachment. Now, when we think about attachments, we think about, um, you know, there's certain attachments that we're conscious of, and there are gross and subtle things. So we can be attached to things like, you know, what we're talking about now in terms of family members, in terms of, you know, maybe our possessions, maybe there's some TV shows, whatever that is. Um, but there are also sort of subtle attachments that we might not be so conscious of. So we all have this pratishta. In one of our disciples' meetings, um, I believe it was in Croatia, Gurmaraj had spoken about Manashiksha. And he spoke at length about Pratishta, which is the attachment to recognition and to fame and to prestige. And these things are actually very subtle. We can talk about them in a class and understand them, but actually not recognize them when they're there in our own selves. Um, so, you know, we can't identify. So, so. The other sort of unhealthy attachment that we need to be careful of, that we need to be conscious of, are our identities and certain mentalities. So you've heard before this concept that people can be attached to um, maybe a victim mentality. And so you've probably seen this, maybe you've experienced it yourself, where sometimes you feel like you've given someone as, you know, as aspiring devotees were often in positions to sort of give some counsel to other people. And do you ever experience that somebody, there's a person who's attached to being in a negative situation. There's a person who is attached and is not able to move themselves out of a situation that can become more positive for them. It's because it's a mentality. So for example, this victim complex or this victim mentality, it's actually quite addictive. And just as the same way, the mentality of like, need to get rich in order to be happy, it's addictive. And be, why is it addictive? Because we start to identify with these mentalities. So if we're not careful, our attachments form our false identity. And so this is also another reason to be conscious of what are our attachments and be conscious of what are those that are healthy versus unhealthy. And so this also reminds me of um, Bhagavad Gita chapter 2 verses 62 and 63. Does anybody know what those verses are? Can anybody say? I always call it the train, the Bhagavad Gita train, these two verses. Okay, so the Bhagavad Gita in those two verses talks about, begins with uh, speaking of the contemplation of the object of the senses, right? Chapter two is the contents of the Bhagavad Gita summarized. Chap uh, verses 62 and 63 talk about 
when one begins with the contemplation of the objects of the senses, that leads to attachment, which leads to lust, which leads to anger, which leads to delusion, which leads to bewilderment of memory, lost intelligence, and then falling back down into the material pool. Now, this, these two verses are so practical. They're so practical and our philosophy is so rich because it demands of us to be cognizant of our thoughts. It demands of us to be cognizant of what our attachments are because Krishna is trying to coach us. He's trying to show us the ways in which we can either choose to become more and more bound to this material world or start to detangle this web that we've created for ourselves since time immemorial. And it all begins with the contemplation of the object of the senses, which leads to attachment. These two verses are teaching us that attachment itself, if divorced from Krishna consciousness, once again, can lead to us falling back down into the material pool. So let's use an example. And let's use an example that's actually, you know, pretty realistic. So let's say um, I'm really craving a promotion at work. Number one, because my identity is somebody who, um, who is successful, and maybe that identity is coming from some um, pressure. Maybe it's from my parents, or maybe it's from society, or maybe it's from colleagues, and I feel like this is who I need to be in order to be accepted. That is subtle. That is so subtle that maybe you don't even realize that's what you're thinking because we can all get carried away by collective consciousness, especially when our association is not devotees, which it tends to not be at work. We can get carried away by this collective consciousness that, hey, success means promotion in two years. So now I start to, I start to contemplate this promotion and everything that will come with that, the extra money and the prestige. As I begin to contemplate this, I become quite attached to this idea. I become quite attached that like, hey, if I make partner, like I start to think about, you know, the other partners and how they were so cool and everybody looked up to them. And now maybe everybody's gonna look up to me because I'm a partner at the firm. And if I'm not careful, I'm starting to identify with that. And I'm taught to identify with that in the material world. I am taught to like, hey, you should walk around like you're a partner, act like a partner, and then it will manifest. That's the whole, that's the new buzzword these days, manifest. Let it manifest. Just start visualizing and contemplating this material identity and it's going to manifest. So now I'm kind of attached to this. And now I'm thinking about, yeah, you know, if I was a partner, I could have like a bigger apartment. Oh my gosh, this example is so real. <laughs> I live in New York City. We all want bigger apartments. So if I had become a partner, then I could get a bigger place, all these things. Now this attachment turns into lust. And what does lust mean? We often think about the word lust as meaning something um, with a sexual connotation, but lust just means attachment to anything material. And in this purport, we've just learned that excessive attachment means when it's divorced from Krishna consciousness. So I'm already out of the realm of Krishna consciousness. I'm on the train because I started contemplating this promotion and the money. I got attached to it. Now I really, really want it. I want it so badly. I start to think about it while I'm cooking. I start to think about it when I'm talking to my husband in the evenings and saying like, hey, okay, so this thing happened at work today and I'm now very work conscious and it's not so Krishna conscious. What happens? Somebody else gets promoted and I didn't get promoted. Now I'm angry because I've been lusting after this and that wasn't fair. That was out of my control. It wasn't fair. Now I'm angry about it. I become deluded and there's a bewilderment of memory and a loss of intelligence. This gets, I get to be so angry to the point that it's just like, I am fuming and I am telling anybody who's gonna listen about how unfair everything is. And you know what? The only way to get ahead is to like backstab that person. So I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna take credit for this thing that this piece of work that they did because, um, because it's the only way to get ahead. And I need to, like, I'm, this is, I've been manifesting this and this is the only way for this to happen. There's a loss of intelligence. There's a bewilderment of memory. Of course, I am acting. I'm performing all these activities, which is accumulating karma. And all that's happening is that I'm going to fall deeper and deeper into the material pool. So these attachments and identities 
are super subtle. And if we're not, Krishna's telling us it's the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This is still the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna is teaching us how these mentalities and these attachments, they're interrelated and they're not always conscious. And so when we contemplate and take inventory of our attachments, there are the things you might think of right away, right? We probably think about our family members. We probably think about our physical, tangible belongings. We might think about, um, I don't know, maybe the city we live in or like, I, I don't know what else, but we think about things. But when we, when we think deeper, we will begin to identify things that are not so obvious. You know, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I was recently experiencing some like interpersonal issues with one of my girlfriends and she really started to step up in our friendship and in the deeply Krishna conscious way, change her behavior and really begin to like contribute more to the friendship. And like, it's extremely admirable what she's doing to become a better person and friend. And I found myself uncomfortable with it. Because I realized, you know what, I'm attached to feeling superior to her. Because when she wasn't being a good friend, guess what, it was feeding my ego. I was attached to being like the bigger person and the better friend. Those are two identities that are so important to me that when somebody starts to threaten that, I started to feel threatened. Because I'm attached to this identity of being a good person, being a good friend and being superior to her. So the deeper and the deeper that we look inside, we're gonna see that these attachments are not just things that we can just identify off the top of our heads. It goes so deep. And according to the Bhagavad Gita, attachments you need to, we need to take a step back from the attachments and start thinking about the contemplation of the objects of the senses. So Bhutta Bhavna Prabhu taught me that the function of the mind is thinking, feeling, and willing. Thinking, feeling, and willing. So think about that. And we can use the same example. Thinking about a promotion and money, I start to really feel like I want it. Then I start to will it to happen. And again, the material world, pop psychology tells us this is good. Start thinking about it. And when you really want something and you really put your mind to it, you can get anything you want. This here in the material world. And this is what we're fed. We are programmed to be disappointed. We are programmed for this Bhagavad Gita train 262 to 63. We are programmed to not recognize when we can get off the train. Because if we get off the train, we're unlike everybody else, but we are just puppets. It's, the Shastras are so true. You know that, that, that painting in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, we're all like with the marionettes that are controlling us. We can choose to be controlled by the modes of material nature, or we can choose to be controlled by Krishna. And we, this is a conscious choice that we need to make at every moment and every day. Otherwise, we will be carried away because the material modes of nature are so strong. So thinking, feeling, willing, behaving. The behavior can be nipped in the bud if we have the ability to identify the thinking first. And if you think about, I read this beautiful book, um, The Book of Dharma by Simon Hobbs. I forget his devotional name. I think it might be Sri Govinda or Sri Gopina Prabhu, but he, his pen name is, and his legal name is Simon Hobbs. And he writes this beautiful book, The Book of Dharma. And in this book, he speaks about how our thoughts, so remember we talked about thinking, feeling, willing leads to behavior. He, talk, he talks about the same concept and takes it a little bit further. He talks about how our thoughts, turn into behavior. And if we're not careful, they turn into habits. So let's just bring this to life again. We'll use the same example. You know what? Let me just like take credit for this person's work. Just this one time. I just, I just really want my boss know, to know that like I'm capable of doing this too. My boss, she gives me all the credit for this. It feels amazing. You know what? I'm just going to do it like one more time. And it's like not super shady because I kind of helped them with this. So like, it's not that bad. It's not that bad to take credit for this. Like, it's cool. I can put my name on that piece of work also. Wow. I just got a raise. Okay. Like, you know what? And if we're not careful, Simon Haas teaches us that behavior then turns to habit. Now it's become a habit. And what happens with habits? If we're not careful, if we don't nip them in the bud, they form our character. 
so what kind of character do we want to have and what kind of character does Srila Prabhupada want us to have? He wants us to have the character of perfect ladies and gentlemen. He wants us to be perfect and kind Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis because we are representing His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami, our own gurus. We're representing Srila Prabhupada. We're representing the entire Parampara. And so our character matters. And therefore, the quality of our thoughts is really at the pinnacle of everything. Now we'll take it a step further. Where do the thoughts reside? The thoughts reside in the mind. What is the mind? The mind is the subtle body. We always talk about how we're not the body, right? We talk when we understand that, like, yeah, like in this life, like, you know, when you give your newcomer talk, you always say, in this life, I am like a brown bodied Canadian female consultant. In my next life, I might be a male, gay, black doctor, you know? So these material bodily designations are temporary. You know, that's, that's the talk we always give. But we don't talk enough about how we're also not the subtle body, which consists of the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. So again, as we talk about attachments to identities, that's what we're talking. We're talking about ego means identity. The false ego means our false identities. Trying to ident me trying to identify with this um, uh, persona of being better than this friend of mine or becoming a partner at the firm one day. This is false ego. That's what it means. We usually think about false ego as pride, but the opposite side is also true. It's the same coin, opposite side, when we think ourselves to be nothing. Instead of thinking, oh, I'm amazing and I deserve, which we also we always sort of equate with false ego. Also thinking, oh, I'm the worst and I don't deserve anything. That is also false ego. That is not the voice of the soul that is speaking. So the subtle body is also super powerful. And the subtle body has been with us since time immemorial, the subtle body comes with us from body to body to body to body to body. So it carries these impressions. It carries these um, um, identities that we bring. When we were born in this life, in these bodies, we obviously, we all know that we, we brought with us countless impressions and identities that form our emotional intelligence, our intelligence, the way we react to situations, the way that we speak to people, it's all material. And so all of this to say that we have to be very conscious of what our attachments are. And again, the point of this verse and the point of the concept of attachment, it's always misunderstood that people think like, so you don't want me to be attached to my family? No, that's not what Krishna is saying. That's not what our devotees, you know, in our movement say. That's not what our senior devotees are meant to say. Um, that's not what they're they're preaching. That's not what they're teaching us. They're teaching us to apply a Krishna conscious lens to everything, to all of our attachments. And the last point that I'll make is that as it relates to our attachments, what's another way to consciously change the nature of our attachments. So we talked about dovetailing our attachments to Krishna. We talked about developing the higher taste so that we can become naturally unattached. But even before we do that, how do we do that? Prabhupada was once asked, Prabhupada, how do I make advancement in Krishna consciousness? And Srila Prabhupada said, it's, it boils down to one word. What was that word? Does anybody know? But the one word is desire. If you want it, it will come. If you don't want it, but you want to want it, it will come. And so if we only have the desire, Krishna says, if somebody just wants, I think it was Krishna, maybe it was Lord Ram. Um, if somebody just wants, sincerely says, I want you, Krishna. I want to be with you in the spiritual world. He said, my heart is sold to that person. I'm, my heart is completely sold to that person. And all that that takes, all that we have to do to express that desire is be sincere. Uta Bhavana Prabhu always tells me that sincerity is your ticket back to Godhead. Perfection is not your ticket back to Godhead. Sincerity is your ticket back to Godhead because sincerity implies 
desires is reflected by desire. So if we just have the desire, even, and again, you know, the self-compassion piece is so important. Let's not be hard on ourselves for the Maya that we think is cute, <laughs> but let's identify it. Let's acknowledge it. Let's work with it. And let's really identify the desire to have that removed from our heart. Because ultimately, as we've learned from Damodar Lila, it's our endeavor plus Krishna's mercy. Our endeavor will never be enough. We always need Krishna's mercy. And Krishna's mercy is always there for the taking. But he will give, he will help us to the extent that A, we want it, and B, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. To the extent that we want it, he will help us. Oh, and B, to the extent that we're ready. And, and we have to be careful because in this material world, as you all know, when we pray for these things, it's gonna come with some pain. <laughs> It will come with some apparent pain. You know, I was just reflecting on this recently. I mean, I wish I could share this whole long story of like the last 20 years of my life, 20 years ago, something happened that caused me a great deal of pain. And it took me a lot of work, a lot of um, uh, mentorship, a lot of guidance from Guru Maharaj and from other senior devotees to get me to a place where I've become indifferent. I've certainly learned so much from that experience. Um, and I've grown so much spiritually from that experience because as we've all experienced, it's often those material distresses and it's written in the, in the Bhagavatam. I mean, our Shastras are so true. These are not theoretical that these distressed it, these distresses, these difficulties are, are custom made for us to surrender more and to the extent that we surrender it you know krishna reciprocates mind you he also says prophet says one step towards krishna he takes a thousand steps back so just a little bit of surrender krishna reciprocates times a thousand and so recently something happened that brought up all of this stuff from 20 years ago that you know i'm still like i'm totally fine um, but something just happened that brought it all back up, like everything. It was crazy. Krishna is so mystical. And in that experience, I really learned once again that our shastras are so true. Krishna has custom made certain difficulties for me, and I'm a nobody, but he made custom, custom made, tailor made experiences for me to have really important realizations about humility about karma, about tolerance, and most importantly, universally, that this material world is not our home. The more we are attached to this material world, it's like the analogy Prabhupada gives, right? Like attached to the golden cage. We're just attached to the gold, but it's still, we're still in the cage or the golden handcuffs. We're still in handcuffs. You know, sometimes I look out, I live in New York City and sometimes, I mean, today we're experiencing a blizzard. And so I cannot see past, I don't know, maybe a mile. And I look out my window and I see some of you, Madame Gopal Prabhu, you've been here. So you see what I see. I see um, subway and I see highway and I see buildings and I see there's a cemetery that I can't see today, but I would usually be able to see. And sometimes I look out this window and I think like, my goodness, what a contrast to what Goloka Vrindavan must look like. Like, sometimes I think of like Radha Sham in the sky, and I think like, you must look here and think this is a hell, because it is. I see factories and industry, industries and, and subways and the Long Island Railroad that's falling apart, and everybody thinks New York is the greatest place to live, and I don't understand why. It's, it's such a microcosm of the material world where it's, there's, it's filled with difficulty and suffering. So all of this to say, Krishna is so, so, so merciful. And if all we do, if the only thing we take away from this discussion is that I want to cultivate the desire to go home back to Krishna, then that is, that is something we can meditate on every single day, because that can translate into our thoughts, our behavior, and, and so on. Um, so thank you so much for allowing me to share some realizations. Um, and my obeisances to each of you who are my teachers and especially to our dear Gurmaraj who genuinely 
so kindly engaged me in the service. It wasn't, again, it wasn't because he thought, Mother Bhakti, you're capable of giving class. It's because I told him I need to study more. And so he he's so personal. Krishna consciousness is so personal. And he, he asked me to give class so that I can read again, read more. And it was so um, rewarding. Thank you for encouraging me genuinely. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? And if there are questions, please help me answer them. <laughs> Hare Krishna Mataji. Thank you so much. That was a very beautiful class, very deep, detailed, and very well studied class, Mataji. Thank you so much. You touched so many points and you also connected it to Bhagavad Gita. And it was a very beautiful class. So I see Raj Prabhu has raised his hand. So Raj Prabhu, please go ahead. Thank you. It's like my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Maharaj, all glories to yourself, all devotees here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful class. I could really, I could really hear and relate to everything that you said. It's wonderful. And I'm glad that you picked this because it's been on my mind for a long time. So we always hear this about not being too attached to family members, etc. Uh, but I never really understood it properly. Could, could you elaborate a little on what does it actually mean or look like? So how do you know when your attachment, say your family members is uh, excessive or it's without Krishna in the center? Yeah, thank you so much. And um, my obeisances to you, Raj Prabhu. Thank you for being here and also for your encouragement on our WhatsApp group. And just in general, thank you for your blessings and encouragement. Um, so the reason why we're told not to have attachment is so that we avoid distress down the line when these attachments naturally, inevitably break, whether that's through death or something else. So as it relates to our family member, family members rather, Krishna is teaching us when one is so attached like the pigeon, then they fall in such deep distress that the pigeon actually also fell into the net of Maya and perished at the hands of the hunter. So when one, if the pigeon were raising his family in Krishna consciousness, and if we can raise our families in Krishna consciousness, the way that it looks different is that I'm sure you can, the way you're living your life today, Prabhu, is with chanting a prescribed number of rounds as parents prescribing those number of rounds for our children, whatever that is, like do one, do two, whatever, just raising them again to be conscious of Krishna. It's not just like a catchphrase, right? It's what uh, Srila Prabhupada is teaching us. We should always be conscious of Krishna. And by doing that, cultivate knowledge and again, that, that torchlight of knowledge that we keep, that we always sort of recite every day, that will prevent us from this kind of distress when that inevitable break happens, because we will all be separated from our loved ones. And so it's not to say that we don't give them love. We don't give them affection. In fact, that's our duty. It's our duty to give them love and affection, but it's also our duty to give them Krishna so that when there is separation, Either let's say, you know, you're the parent and when you're, when you leave, you will have done your duty and equipped them with the tools to cope so that they don't also fall into the net of the hunter and they don't die at the hands of the hunter, but they're able to transcend that and they're able to understand and cope in such a way that they can actually use the tragedy to come deeper into their spirituality. So again, attachment is going to be there. It's very natural. And again, it's encouraged. Prabhupada said, I love all living entities. And he's showing us by example, we have to love all living entities. And naturally we have attachment for our close family members. So it's not that that can't happen, but once again, engaging in Krishna conscious discussions, um, engaging in the six loving exchanges, learning the Shastra together. Um, six loving exchanges includes um, revealing one's mind in confidence and inquiring confidentially, those activities will help us to become deeper in Krishna consciousness. And then when a devotee leaves his or her body, it's actually like a glorious occasion 
where you feel in the midst of your deep distress, you also feel a sense of happiness. And that's why we celebrate both the appearance and disappearance days of the great sages, because it's a celebration of their life. And so when that inevitable break in the relationship comes, it's a different, it's a celebration. And it's also, again, we've been equipped with the tools to deal with that because the relationship had Krishna in the center. Um, would anybody else like to contribute to that answer? Raj Prabhu, you as well. Was there, was there anything else that you would add to that? No, I think that's, I think that's not, that's perfect because it's been very helpful. Because you're always like worried because, uh, Am I doing, am I have got Krishna in the center in this relationship or not? Because uh, obviously we ourselves, we're trying to read and nicely and uh, do service and sanghas and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's on our mind a lot, a lot of the time, most of the time. But obviously family members, they're not always up the whole way there. They're, they're, they're still mixed sometimes. And sometimes it feels more like you're holding back because if you splurt out philosophy, for example, it's just going to push them away. So you're kind of like holding back sometimes just to connect. Uh, but yeah, that 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 makes me feel better because as long as you're trying to do all of those things, then it does mean that you're not being excessively attached and you have got Krishna in the centre. I really appreciate that, Prabhu. And one of the things that Vishayashuka Prabhu says that I really appreciate, you know, he's super practical. He always says that, like, we have to leave everyone with a good impression. And that's the most effective preaching, right? So we don't, it's also keeping Krishna in the center when we decide to, like, tone it back, to tone it down a little. Because if I, if I keep pushing on something, it might give a wrong impression, and that will actually push them further away from Krishna. So you are being deeply Krishna conscious when you make the decision to not push on this point, to not harp that like, you know, you have to stop eating meat or, you know, why aren't you doing with these six? I'm not saying this is what you do, but sometimes people will, will be hard on their family members for not doing certain things. And sometimes the best thing to do is to give them gentle reminders, nudges, give them some knowledge, some tidbits when they're open the way that they're open. And they will have a good impression and they will gradually, the material world is such that the suffering is going to come and they will come to you. Part of the being, keeping Krishna in the center is being an example of how, because I am practicing Krishna consciousness, I have these coping mechanisms, I am grounded so that when the inevitable suffering comes their way, they will come to you guys and they'll observe you by your example. And I don't know if I close the loop on what I was saying before about this 20 year thing when this thing came up that brought up this thing that happened 20 years ago, I was able to reflect on how those really difficult times 20 years ago genuinely served as a catalyst in my spiritual life because it's unavoidable. Even if like by Krishna's grace, like many of us are privileged, you know, we have jobs, we didn't lose our jobs during the pandemic or, you know, we're healthy, we're, we're able to be here. But even for those of us who have these apparently privileged lives, of course, we're grateful for that. But that doesn't mean that the material world is not going to bring us suffering as well. It's the nature of the world. So when that time comes for your family members, not if, but when, they will come to you if they see such an example of somebody who copes with adversity so beautifully and who seems so grounded amidst the chaos of the world. So please know that yeah, like what you're doing, just giving love and affection and being an example is highly Krishna conscious and it's an art. Thank you, Mataji, for that beautiful answer. Anyone else has any question or comments or realizations to share? Please go ahead. Okay, uh, Mataji, I, have, I was just thinking that in the verse uh, where 24 gurus are mentioned, so pigeon is one of them. So I was just thinking why specifically pigeon, because this is a kind of, a, in general, bird mentality, bird tendency, right? Like all the birds would be, will do the same. So 
I was just thinking why specifically pigeon? Actually, I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's like a deeper meaning or if it was just, he just chose one kind of bird to demonstrate the point. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll see if I can find out if there's a deeper meaning to that one. Maybe also because um, you pigeons and you think that they're foolish right because they are like just the way i mean again i live in new york city like nobody likes a pigeon um but then when you see that we're just like the pigeons it's almost like yeah it's better than saying we're just like cardinals because some people might say like oh it's nice <laughs> but being a pigeon is not it's not something to to want to relate to i'm just this is just my guess i don't know if there's this is a real deeper meaning but i would think that that might be one one reason that um a pigeon is used because we're just like the pigeons and we don't want to be just like pigeons. So okay. good question. <laughs> no, because I was thinking there is one more bird mentioned in the same words, Kurara bird or something. I, I have I don't know much about it, but that is also a bird, right? Yeah. So, the Kurara bird. Kurara bird, yeah. So there are I, two words mentioned, it means in the words. So I was just thinking about it. Yeah, you know, no, thank you. That's a really, I love questions like that. It's questions that I don't think of. Um, and I don't remember the Carrera bird example off the top of my head, but once again, it's chapter seven on the 11th canto, and it will be probably after verse, like mm -hmm. later than 52. So please do sure. have a read. And if whoever wants to stay on the line, maybe we can see if we can find it together. Thank you, Mataji. And we have Shama, Shamarani Mataji. Mataji, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, dear God, hey. sister, please accept my humble obeisance. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you, all glories to Guru Maharaj. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful, wonderful class. Um, I think you answer most of my answer, um, answers um, by talking to Raj Prabhu. But the one thing I really want to ask is, um, so sometimes, um, as you know, the topic is like amazing topic, attachment is like, wow. <laughs> Um, so my question is that um, sometimes do you think um, we have a certain attachment, but maybe Krishna wants to um, teach us something by giving that attachment? Do you think is sometimes is that the reason? Oh, 100%. 100%. And in particular, if we really root in the root of our attachments, it boils down to false ego. And that is the biggest attachment he's trying to break. He's trying to break us from having this misidentification with the material energy in the material world. And we've been, again, we've been here for so, since time immemorial. Think about it as the whole of eternity. So that is so, so difficult to break. So the more he shows us, you know, look at, look at the acceleration of the age of Kali. It's just, I mean, it's exhausting. You know, we're in a particularly exhausting time and that's the world around us. And then our own internal worlds, you know, again, the suffering is coming ultimately so that we stop identifying with this world, with the modes, with these bodies. And we start to really feel this isn't my home. This isn't where I belong. And that's Krishna, as Prabhupada would say, this is not a place for a lady or a gentleman. And especially now that's just so clear where it might have sounded theoretical before. But now you look at the so-called leaders of this world and the way that they're behaving, the way that you can see the need for Varnashram so deeply, you know, just so deep. It is so, it's never been more clear. Again, our Shastras have the answers to everything. And so I think that's what it is. It's he's creating these attachments so that we can have enough exposure to realize that like, wait a second, this isn't this isn't right. This doesn't feel like where I live. And so that we can develop that desire that we talked about to get out. Because as much as I'm sitting here speaking, you know, emphatically, I know that if Krishna came right now and said, hey, you want to come home? I'd be like, wait, can I just like, can I just do this thing first? Like, like I'm this, you know, whatever, like I'm this close to making partner. Like I, I would probably say that. <laughs> I would probably be like, yeah, for sure. Just let me do this like one thing or this two, and then that one thing would turn into three things or whatever that is. And that's, that's many, many people in the world feel that way. So yes, and he consistently gives us chance after chance and he will give us the attachment just to show us that it's unhealthy. 
and just to show us that that's not who we are, that's not our identification. Yeah, and, and Sean, who you are senior to me, I love you so much. How would you answer that question? What else would you add to that? No, I think that's brilliant what you just say that, um, you know, he's putting you into all these challenges and um, all these attachments. Um, I think it's just, it's just me, isn't it? I need to identify that and um, learn from it. Um, that what... Sorry, please. Mm. And, and I think also, did I cut you off? Did you? No, 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 no. Um, Krishna also has a way of fulfilling our material and spiritual desires at the same time, right? So maybe he's providing some of this attachment to fulfill a material desire, but ultimately he does it in a way to root out that material desire as well. So I had this material desire to become a partner. I became a partner, I'm attached to it. And then I realized how hellish that life is. And now I don't want it anymore. And I want Krishna. So he can fulfill both because he's so mystical and he can do that for us too. He's so personal. Wonderful answer. Thank you so much. So much helpful. Thank you. So much. I know that, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead, Mahatish. I was no, just, I was, you go. <laughs> I was just calling Raj Prabhuji because he raised hand, but you please go ahead if you were saying something. Oh, no, please, Raj Prabhu. Please. Uh, if you have time for another question. Uh, uh, you were saying earlier about how, uh, I'm not sure what term you use, but let me use my term instead, like bad experiences from the past. Uh, everyone is a lesson. And I'd probably actually extend that to every interaction you have with everyone or anyone and everyone is actually designed to teach you something, help you on that path. But specifically on the bad experiences, uh, I know that our teachers always say it's a lesson and you need to internalize, reflect, examine to enable you to learn from that lesson and what is the teaching but that's not the easiest thing to do and uh, I wanted if you had any tips or ideas or suggestions to help us do that. My husband told me once really helped me I was thinking about you know some people who have apparently really hurt me in the past um, and, you know, two things. We, maybe we've all heard, you know, think of them as the instruments of your karma, right? So, and your karma is always there to teach you something. But the other thing that he said, he gave me a really powerful visualization that it just really stuck with me when I actually did it. So he said, imagine when you're leaving your body, if this world is a stage and you're leaving your body and you arrive in a theater, and when you look up on the stage, the curtains raise or rise rather, and you see all of those people who deeply hurt you and they're smiling and they're clapping because you made it. You made it back to Godhead and they were there on your path to push you. And when I actually visualized like people who deeply, like I felt deeply betrayed by them, when I imagined that, I mean, it actually like shook me because I was like, yeah, that's how I should think of them. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't mean that I visualize that and now I'm fine today. It took a long amount of time, many years before I got to the place where I can be like, yeah, you know what? I wish them well and I thank them for pushing me because again, I was catapulted deeper into Krishna consciousness. So that's one thing in terms of the people on my path who've apparently hurt me. And my else, yeah, like back to Tirta Swami says the same thing. Like every interaction is an opportunity to um, give and share Krishna's love. So if it's not anything else, that's why they're coming across our path. So it could be a stranger at a grocery store just by wearing the neck beads and like maybe, you know, not, you don't even have to, but even if you were wearing Dodi Kurta and you're kind, that's preaching. 
that's sharing Krishna consciousness. So every person on your path, like a cashier at a grocery store or like a friend that you were friend with, friends with for like a year and then they left, whatever, no matter what kind of person it is, the reason we can always say is to give Krishna or their senior to receive Krishna. If they're peers to share with each other and learn from each other, at the very least we can say that. And then for the people who have heard us, think of them as Krishna's agents to remember he's custom made these experiences for you because that's what you needed for some reason to go back back to Godhead. And if we choose to learn those lessons in this life, we won't have to learn them again. That's how we can think. And everything comes through other people. All of Krishna's messages, not all, but many of Krishna's messages come from interactions with others. Sometimes it can come from a stranger. You, when Krishna wants to tell you something, this is something else Buddha Bhavana always says. He says, like, when Krishna wants you to know something, he's going to find, like, one way and then another way and then another way. He's going to make sure you hear it again and again and again and again. So it could be from five different people or whatever that is. So in that way also, you can think of like, you know, your interact. Yesterday, I was um, reflecting with a friend on the phone, actually with the Bhavana Prabhu's wife, Bhakti Gamiya Prabhu. Um, I was reflecting on this like 20 year experience that I was having. And um, um, and she said that, yeah, she just made the same point that like, you know, every one of those people were instruments on your path you know, every single person. And so that's, um, that's also just another way that we can try to think about that. Wow, that was amazing. That's absolutely amazing. I'll always remember that now. Thank you very much. I apologize yeah, for uh, pushing on something that's so personal, but I'm so glad that you shared that. No, oh, thank you so much for asking, Prabhu. question i want to be respectful of everybody's time um genuinely my obeisances to each of you thank you so much for i'm i'm really like not at all qualified so i'm just very grateful that you've given me this opportunity to again for my own growth and purification thank you so much Thank you so much, Mataji. I really appreciate today's class. Thank you for your time, your association. And uh, I, I really look forward to hearing more and more from you. Uh, if uh, no one has, okay, there are my messages in the chat. So would you like, well, do you want me to read that for you, Mataji? If you are Archana's team, Archana Siddhi Mataji says, wonderful class, Radha Bhakti Mataji. I was meditating on what you said. Attachments become your false identity. And Guru Maharaj said, if you are attached to something, there is always fear to lose it. Thank you so much for this wonderful class, Haribo. Yes, even I was, yeah, even that, that was really nice when you shared that our attachments is our false identity. That is so true. And also Anusya Mataji has shared in the beginning that, uh, one second, that I feel like I have million attachments when I go deeper and look inside, it's overwhelming. I was thinking that you were just speaking my mind because we all feel the same. So yeah, these are the wonderful messages from devotees. So if no one else has any question or anything to share with your permission, Mataji, we can end the call here. Thank you so much once again. Uh, I would like to pay my obeisance. Okay, Dharma Vatsala Prabhuji has raised his hand. Thank you very much for your class. Uh, I didn't uh, so patient, but <laughs> I was in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Rich. You are very qualified for preaching for um, this lecture. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm very inspired. But, you know, what I learned from each of you is humility. Arjuna Siddhi Mataji, Dharma Vatsala Prabhu, you're my big brother and big sister. And it's just, I feel so loved when, when you encourage me. So thank you so much.
You're so uninspiring to me. Thank you. Probably your English is uh, too difficult for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't understand much. <laughs> That's why you thought it was good because you didn't understand most of it. <laughs> and I understand uh, a little bit. I, I was so, so inspired. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Radha Bhakti. Um, yeah, very wonderful class. I felt very inspired and I felt like what you spoke uh, really answered a lot of my questions. And it's nice to hear um, from different speakers because they have different realizations and different ways of um, presenting Krishna consciousness. So I'm really glad I tuned in today and I got to see you and uh, hear from you. I'm sure Guru Maharaj will be very happy with this lecture. Hare Krishna. Now let's pray he doesn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your encouragement, my dear brother, Madam Gopal Prabhu. Hare Krishna. All the best. Well, we'll just want to respect your time as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mataji. I would like to pay my obeisances. One chakra for Taruvia's chakra, Kripas in the way which a Paditanam Pavanipio, Vaishravi Pio Namonamaha, Anantakoti Vaishnav in the Kijai, Srila Prabhupad Kijai, Guru Maharaj Kijai, Her Grace Radha Bhakti Mataji Kijai. Thank you all so much for joining. Mataji, once again, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I will end the call. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Mataji. Hare Krishna.